the Zoom as well, since we now offer hybrid options. So my name is Sarah Langston. I am the head of special collections here in the library. Uh, this event with John Silito is actually co-sponsored by the Friends of the Stewart Library and the History Department. So we, <laughs> yay, yay, Sarah. Thank you for agree, you know, for letting us do this. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, John Silito. John is the former head of special collections and university archives, which was how I first got to know John. Um, he's also a retired professor from the history department. Um, he is the author of several books, including History's Apprentice, B.H. Roberts' Diaries, A World We Thought We Knew, A History of Utah Radicalism, and my favorite book, Images of America Ogden, only because I co-authored it with him. Uh, John was recently selected as a fellow of the Utah State Historical Society this last year. So good for John. So I'm gonna turn it over to John. He'll speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then he'll have questions that he can answer. So anyone who has them, or if you have them on Zoom, please type them into the chat and we will ask them as well. So I will turn it over to John. Well, thank all of you for being here. If I speak at about this level, can you hear me? Good. I have seasonal allergies. It doesn't matter what season it is, I have allergies. So my voice is a little croaky, but it isn't COVID or the flu. I was tested today for both and I'm negative on both of them. So it's just allergies. Um, now I got to put my glasses on so I can't see you, but I can see this and we'll switch later. I, again, thanks and thanks to Sarah for the two Sarahs for arranging this. Um, um, Sarah worked for me for many years here. I, I got pretty good taste in folks. She's done a great job. After I left, she took over and she's done a wonderful job. And she's got years left to continue to do wonderful jobs. So I appreciate it. I'm going to kind of read talk because if I don't, I'll wander off and about midnight you'll say, well, he shut up. And, you know, so um, Brigham H. Roberts, 1857, 1933 was an important figure in what Tom Alexander calls the era of Mormonism in transition, 1890 to 1930, pre-statehood to the anniversary of, of in 1990. Roberts was a lot of things in that uh, 40 year period. He was a missionary, he was a authority, he was a journalist, a politician, a historian, a theologian. He ran for Congress twice, was defeated once, then elected, and he was expelled from Congress because he had three wives. Everybody knew it, but they expelled him anyway as one of the persons they couldn't stand the wives. I also believe that during his lifetime, during that period, 1890 to 1900, uh, he was Mormonism's most prominent public intellectual. And we'll kind of talk about that in a minute. When he was at the height of his powers, Roberts may have been the best known and most recognizable, both within the church and throughout the nation. But partly that was due to the notoriety he gained in the national campaign to deny him a seat in Congress. But there were other things, as we will say, see as well. Many scholars have examined Robert's life and career. So how does my book differ? Well, it seeks to provide a, a single volume account of Robert's, the public person. That's the important distinction. Um, a politician, a writer, a thinker, and above all, an exponent of Mormonism in word and print. It does not examine his role as a theologian. Others much more qualified than, than I have done that. Uh, it does not provide an examination of him as a historian. Again, others more, more uh, uh, capable than me have done that. It, at the same time, it's not a family history. Uh, my late colleague, our late colleague, Richard Roberts did that. Um, I've literally spent most of this current century trying to understand the first through editing the diaries that Sarah mentioned and over the last way too many years working on this. Like any biographer, I have an ambivalent relationship with my subject. Sometimes I honestly can't stand him. Other times I don't even see his flaws. Wow, what a wonderful guy. 
Uh, on balance, however, I view him as amazing, if occasionally annoying. So why the ambivalence? Well, he could be petty, vindictive, arrogant, self-important, and insufferable at times. A January 4th, 1898 diary reads, home, SLC, chess, and Dante. Okay, I get it now. You're a hotshot intellectual. Got it, got it. Um, he struggled with alcohol and it affected his behavior and his judgment. He battled depression, the black dog, he called it, which sometimes made interpersonal relationships difficult. He wasn't the greatest husband or father, and, and he had finally admitted that. And his views on woman suffrage, as we'll see, were hardly, hardly enlightened, even for his times. After his death, the missionaries who served under him in the Eastern states from 1922 to 1927, arguably the most important mission in the LDS church, and some other friends erected a grave marker down in the Centerville Cemetery that says, churchman, soldier, statesman. Well, all of those are accurate descriptions of B.H. Roberts. My triptych tonight is a different one. Politician, polygamist, public intellectual. For those that are not familiar with Roberts, let me just give you a little overview of his early life. He was born in England to Mormon converts. His mother, Anne, was a committed Latter-day Saint. His father, Benjamin's Mormonism was at best perfunctory. And eventually, knowing her husband would object and never change, Anne decided in 1862, with the help of the Perpetual Emigrating Fund, to flee England for Utah. She took with her her two younger children, and she left her 12-year-old daughter and five-year-old B.H. under the care of some local state, saints. Uh, B.H., who was then called Henry, was put under the charge of the Tobys, a poor, wandering, alcoholic couple who at various times tried to get rid of him. And if they'd succeeded, we'd be someplace else tonight, but they didn't. At one point, they even offered him to the army as a drummer boy. Makes you wonder how that would have turned out. Well, it was a hand to mouth existence from which Roberts was ultimately freed. Along with his sister and after a long journey across the sea and across the plains, uh, they arrived in Utah in uh, September of 1866. Let me read a little bit from his autobiography because I think it tells you a lot about Robert. As the group traveled down Immigration Street, which is today's, if you know, Salt Lake, Third South, and turned on Main Street, young B.H. later recalled he found himself at the head of the lead yoke in the team, walking up the principal street of the city, the rest of the team following. Here the people had turned out to welcome the Plains-worn immigrants and were standing on the street sides to greet them. <laughs> Along the road, he says, I saw a charming little girl approaching me in the middle of the street. The dainty little lady offered him a fruit basket of peaches, plums, and grapes. Roberts took what he said he supposed was a reasonable portion, shared them with his sister, then resumed his place at the front of the train, and in his words, marched on until the head of Main Street was reached. He was nine. It's a captivating and illuminating scene. One senses that for the first time in a long time, perhaps ever, Roberts felt he was home. That sense of belonging, geographically and spiritually, would mark him for the rest of his life. Despite the conflicts, defeats, and occasional disappointments he experienced both as a Utah and as a Mormon, B.H. Roberts was to his core a Latter-day Saint, and a Utah, even if by adoption and not by birth. After coming to Utah, uh, Anne had married a widower named William Nichols. It's not clear if she ever divorced Ben, but anyway. Uh, after he died, she married a guy named Seth Dustin and had her last child with, with Dustin. B.H. Uh, joined with his mother living um, up around here, this area and living also with Seth and his what he called unruly sons. I guess they were quite a bunch of juvenile delinquents. As he recalled, I joined up with a gang of horse thieves, and for a while I roamed the hills and back country. I took my whiskey straight and my coffee black, but it didn't last too long, as I could see no future in that. Then I got a chance to, I don't know whether you could see no future, exactly whether it was black coffee or whiskey, but, but it didn't last too long, as I could see no future in that. Then I got a chance to work with a blacksmith. 
Well, in the midst of this marginalized life, bountiful blacksmith James H. Baird gave him a chance to apprentice. He lived with the Baird family. It gave him stability for three years. It taught him a skill. It led him to the one-room school of Hannah Flint Holbrook and then to the John Morgan Commercial College. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, to the Young Men's Club of Centerville, whose library provided books and ideas, and where after much effort, much effort, he mastered public speaking. In 1877, he married Eliza Smith, the daughter of William R. Smith, Davis State President, and his plural wife, Emmeline Levitt Smith. With the financial assistance of the local bishop and others, he attended the University of Deseret, now the University of Utah. He, he blossomed at the university. He, he was just in his element. Um, he received a territorial superintendent scholarship, which was repaid by teaching for a period of time. And he actually became the valedictorian of the class of 1878. Now, let's go to the P's now, first politician. Not long after that graduation, Roberts taught school fulfilling the requirements of his scholarship. Then he left for his first mission. Initially, it was in Iowa, but the climate was hard on his sinuses. Got it. I understand. And he was transferred to Tennessee. No thanks. I'll stay here instead. It was there in August 1884 that two Mormon missionaries, John H. Gibb and William S. Berry, were murdered at a place called Cane Creek. Roberts, disguised as a tramp, and there's a picture of, or there's a copy of that photo in the book, it's a famous photo, retrieved the bodies and had them returned to Utah. The event gained press attention in Utah and literally throughout the nation. He was 27 and was a household name among the saints and his prominence combined with a predisposition led him very quickly to, uh, toward politics. He was known at that period of time as the sagebrush or as the blacksmith orator because of his apprenticeship. And he supported what was then called sagebrush democracy, which was the word for the Democratic Party in territorial Utah. He operated mostly on the Davis County level. Uh, he was elected to the Constitutional Convention. It was here uh, he opposed woman suffrage. Well, Democrats at their territorial party convention said they were unequivocally in favor of woman suffrage. He was a Democrat. Roberts was advised by the church hierarchy, hierarchy not to impede the passage of a woman's suffrage clause in the Constitution. They were for it. He acted on his own. He knew there was overwhelming support for suffrage. He also knew there was some opposition among both Mormon and what in Utah parlance, Gentile members of the Constitutional Convention. And this is where the story gets interesting because he couldn't avoid saying what he thought. He should have just stayed quiet. At one point, Roberts told the convention that there's not a suffragist among you that has a higher of opinion than I do. Moreover, he told his colleagues that the influence of woman as it operates upon me never came from the rostrum. It never came from the pulpit with woman in it, never came from the lecturer's platform with woman speaking. It came from the fireside. It comes from the blessed association with mothers, of sisters, of wives, of daughters, not as Democrats and Republicans. Roberts also raised in the same vein the question uh, the role suffrage might play if it were granted to women in terms of domestic happiness. It was probably one of his most ill-considered and intemperate remarks, yet it was also probably pretty honest and revealing. He asked his colleagues to, colleagues to imagine a man who returned home after a hard day from struggling to elect the candidate which he believes will serve the interests of the people coming home from the sweat and heat of a campaign meeting, tired and weary of the world, only to be met at the door by a wife opposed to him politically, thus forcing him to either go over the fight on the issues of the day or else observe a sullen silence because of the impropriety of engaging in a discussion along these lines. Gentlemen, he said, <clears throat> and they all were, leave the home alone, keep political strife out of it. Women of Utah be content to reign over the empire of domestic life. And it will bring you more joy to your hearts than all the success you could have in casting your ballots at the polls. Well, needless to say, his remarks raised the ire of pro-suffrage forces, men and women, and the female pro-suffrage forces in Utah were some pretty formidable folks. 
and they took it took a little while for them to forgive him for that, and some of them never forgave him. Well, clearly the episode at the convention was not his first, uh, his uh, finest moment. Uh, he justified doing it. He said he believed that if they left that plank in, Congress would use it as a way to, to not give you statehood. I see absolutely no evidence. Everybody was ready. Congress was ready for statehood. Church was ready, the local Gentile community, everybody was ready. He was just making up an issue. After that, two congressional campaigns followed. He ran that same year, 1895, where the issue of women's suffrage dogged him. He repented and said, oh my goodness, nobody was more for women's suffrage than I was. Where did you think? And, and he offered me a couple all over Utah. Uh, the main issue that, that year in Utah was not women's suffrage. Everybody pretty much agreed on that. It was the issue of the coinage of silver at the ratio of 16 to one. Utah was a silver state, think Park City. Um, and he ran a very good race. He lost a close race, but his candidacy led to conflict with some of the church leaders. Roberts and a guy named Moses Thatcher, who aspired to the Senate, were accused of seeking office without consulting the brethren. Roberts believed he had the permission from Joseph F. Smith and others to run. He said, I thought I had it. Well, they urged him to repent from his words and actions against general authorities on political principles. It had been brewing for a little while. That thing with the suffrage was part of it and some other things. Finally, it came to a head in the spring of 1896 when Roberts's ecclesiastical activities and the member of the <clears throat> first quorum of 70 were suspended. Roberts finally apologized for his actions. Thatcher never did. In April um, of that year, a conference, the church issued what they call the political manifesto. Um, what it says is before accepting any position that would interfere with the discharge of ecclesiastical duties, leading church officials should apply to the proper authorities to determine whether he could function adequately in both positions. Well, once that was over and they sent him on a mission to kind of get him out of town for a while, came back and ran again in 1898, and, and won, he won convincingly. 5,600 votes more than the Republican. Two years before that in 1896, the Democratic candidate for president of the United States, William Jennings Bryan carried Utah with 80% of the vote. Uh, those were the days I tell you. <laughs> um, he carried 18 of Utah's 27 counties. He carried Salt Lake, Utah, Weber, Davis, and almost immediately after the election, which was in November of 1898, now the Congress didn't meet for almost for more than a full year till November of 1899, but almost immediately there were calls for his expulsion. They were led by the journalist, the yellow journalist, William Randolph Hearst, and a group of evangelical Christian, particularly Christian women who were at the forefront. Uh, they denounced him, assuming that by extension, they were battling polygamy specifically and Mormonism generally. Ultimately, 7 million signatures were gathered and presented to Congress. Here you go, we're all against him. Congress faced two choices, seat him and throw him out or just not seat him at all. And ultimately the second prevailed. He had very little support from either party, even the Democrats really didn't support him. I think there were 50, 48 votes in the final expulsion against him. Okay, politician, second P is polygamist. Roberts married Celia Dibble in October of 1884. Celia was our colleague Richard Roberts's, in his words, sweet grandma. Um, she had been one of BH's students. Um, uh, Roberts went to England to escape prosecution for that marriage, came back, served a prison term for unlawful cohabitation. Um, um, you know, he had paid a lot for the, the principle of, um, of, pl of plural marriage. Roberts learned about the Woodruff Manifesto in 1890 while returning from Southern Utah with apostles Francis M. Lyman, uh, John W. Taylor, Abram Cannon, and John Henry Smith. Initially, he said, the spirit said to me, it's all right, this is the right thing to do. And then he started thinking about it. And he thought about all that had happened to the saints, including himself, all that they had suffered, going to jail, having to take wives out of state. Celia had to live over in the Mormon colonies in Colorado. And he just said, I can't agree with this. And in his words at the October 1890 conference, 
in the awfulest moment of my life, he said. I could not and did not vote for it. Now, he later said he kind of came to an accommodation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, he had three wives, as I told you. That's why they wouldn't put him in Congress. Uh, his third wife was a woman named Margaret Curtis Shipp. She was a sister wife of Ellis R. Shipp. They were both medical doctors in the late 19th century here in Utah. They were married uh, polygamous uh, wives of Milford Bard Shipp. The key question isn't whether he married Margaret or not. The key question is, when were they married? He claimed it was in April of 1890, okay? April 1890, manifesto. September, October, 1890. So, no, no, we got married in April and it was performed by Daniel H. Wells, who he said had also performed his marriage to Celia. Interesting. More interesting, Wells died March 24th, 1891. So he was not around to question. Roberts never deviated from that date, 1890. Census records, testimony in the Smoot hearing, everything, 1890. Well, <clears throat> I don't think so. Mike Quinn is very definite. If you knew the late Mike Quinn, Mike could be very definite. March 19th, 1891 or thereabouts, but certainly not April 1890. I don't know Mike's source. I wish I did. Still, most scholars believe it was a, what we call a post-manifesto marriage. And estimates range from 1891, remember that Daniel H. Wells died in March 1890. 1891 to 1894. A notorious Mormon, what was called a polyg chaser, polygamous chaser. Charles Most and Owen believe the marriage was in the spring of 1894. Okay. No, Hardy, I... a, another historian says Ship was living with her first husband until at least 1892. Other uh, sources say, well, there may have been a, a cancellation of sealing in 1888 or 1890. Remember, these marriages were not legal marriages, they were performed in the endowment house. And so the divorce would have to be a church divorce. One source suggests that, that she didn't marry BH until after Milford died. Well, he died in 1918. So he, he, they married long before that. Richard Roberts quotes a 2007 letter from the church history library's manager of library public affairs, that they were probably married sometime between late 1892 and 1894. Never is the year 1890 mentioned, 1892-94, and goes on to say, there's probably no existing paperwork uh, to prove the marriage. But clearly, they said, the letter says, it was a post-manifesto oh. marriage. Well, I wish we knew for sure. If I could get BH right here, I'd say, when were you married? The problem is he'd say, April 1890. I don't give me that. That's not even B.H. could be very disingenuous when it came to the question of poor marriage. Now, remember, he'd suffered, you know, including jail time. Uh, in late 1884, November to be exact, he was asked by a reporter if he believed polygamy to be legally, morally, and theologically respond, right. He responded, yes, I do. But when the reporter asked him if he practiced it, okay, he replied, well, not literally or personally. Well, he just married Celia a month ago, okay? And according to Quinn, Roberts preached in 1893 in Colonia Diaz that plural marriage was a correct principle and will remain on the earth somewhere and the sun will shine on it forever. As I say, we don't have a, a diary, a real diary account, but he does mention he was in Colonia Diaz on that sunny Sunday morning. Well he doesn't, in his diary, say what Quinn says he said. Quinn must have found it in somebody else's journal. I wish I knew which one. Okay, third P, pu public intellectual. What do I mean? There are many definitions, but for my purposes, a public intellectual is someone who engages huh? in intellectual pursuits, expounds oh, intellectual concerns in a way that a broad, literate public Roberts. can understand. Oh. And is seen by the general public as willing to comment on many different topics and concerns. So that's what I think he was. Well, how did Robert he become Sam that? This yeah. poor boy like that got the plums yeah. and the grapes when he was nine. Well, <laughs> missions were very much a part of Roberts's becoming Mormonism's preeminent public intellectual. Uh, he went on several of them, several at the 
request of the First Presidency, expounding on the faith, refining his views, and always attracting press attention. Wherever he went, the reporters searched him out to, to interview. Another important mm -hmm. factor in the process, and this isn't really an important chapter in the book, was his effort to gain a hearing for the church at the Parliament of Religions held at the Chicago <laughs> World's Fair in 1893. He, he was unsuccessful in getting that, uh, that um, uh, hearing, but it garnered a, garnered a huge amount of publicity, mostly favorable for the church, due to the failure of the conference organizers to include um, um, Mormonism on the agenda. In addition to these activities, Robert spoke widely throughout the church. I mean, state conferences, ward conferences, special meetings in the tabernacle. All of these were widely reported in the press, and many people believed that Roberts was the preeminent orator of Mormonism in his time. Um, he used radio. He lived long enough that he was on KSL on a weekly um, series in 1931 or two. As far as I know, and if somebody knows something different than this, please correct me, but as far as I know, uh, there isn't a, recorded, uh, a recording of his voice. I'd love to hear what he sounded like whether he maintained some of that British accent or whether he lost it over time. Um, and of course, there was his voluminous writing, histories, polemics, theology, even fiction in books, magazines, and newspapers. And he wasn't confined just to secular topics. He spoke and was quoted on all kinds of things. At one point, he took an interest in, in racing. Now, he was generally pretty supportive, but at times, he could be critical. Now, I don't know whether that meant he had a critical race theory or not. He spoke on lots of things. An additional step took place in World War I and after, and after. Roberts was an early, fervent supporter of Wilson's war to make the world safe for democracy and to end all wars. That's the goal, he said. It's a righteous cause. Let's do it. He came home from that war a changed man. He was a chaplain at, at 60. Um, I must tell you how he survived basic training at 60 when I could barely survive it at 22 is a mystery to me. But he got the task of writing home to the wives and mothers of the lost. None of the people in the unit, which was overwhelming in Utah and, and Western, were killed in action. But a couple of dozen died from the influenza. He came on the changed man, very different much more reflective, much more vulnerable than when he went. And he became an advocate of world peace. His strong, he was the strongest voice in Utah in favor of the US entering the League of Nations, which never happened. And he clashed all over the state with his most, foremost opponent, J. Reuben Clark. Um, what else? Well, as I mentioned, from 1922 to 1927, he led the Eastern States mission. That was a very important assignment that took him to the major center, uh, centers of influence uh, in the Northeast, New York, where the mission, uh, technically Brooklyn, where the mission was head headquartered, Boston, Philadelphia, and the District of Columbia. Uh, you know, I mean, that's where the major press of America existed. And so all of these factors, I think, led to that category of being a public intellectual. B. H. Roberts was a complicated and controversial and complex guy. He certainly deserves ongoing study. Leonard Arrington called Roberts the intellectual leader of the Mormon people in the era of Mormonism's finest intellectual attainment. And while not a trained historian, Roberts was not a trained historian, Arrington also said that he significantly influenced the way most Mormons thought about their history by making use of primary sources. He was more of a, an editor or a collector than he was a, a, a historian in, in some ways. But there's a body of history that's been useful in the years since. Sterling McMurrin, a philosopher, uh, lamented the lack of interest in Roberts for many years and celebrated the, the reemergence of interest in Roberts, which took place in the 18 or in the 1980s, when books were published and the B.H. Roberts Society flourished. And, he became better known then than he'd been for 50 years. He called Roberts, McMurrin called Roberts, the most interesting and exciting and stimulating person in church leadership. His most prolific writer, 
its chief theologian and historian, and its most capable defender. When asked what was his most lasting contribution, McMurrin said Roberts wrote directly. It was always clear what he was driving at. So let me close this talk in the same way I end the book. The prominent American historian, Eric Foner, we all know Eric Foner, 1700, yeah. A uh, great American historian was asked once what he had learned as his study of reconstruction had proceeded over the years. To paraphrase, he said that the fate of all historians was that no book was the final word. They expected that their work would be challenged and eventually superseded by the work of others. As he observed, I've simply written the latest word, not the last word, indeed. Well, thank you very much for your attention. If if there are questions, I'll get my, my glasses now, I can see you. What a handsome group. If there are questions or comments, um, feel free. Sarah. So, thank you so much. It's always good to hear your voice and to hear your thoughts on this narrative. And I know that this has been a long project for you. What was the most um, unexpected thing or event or episode that you found out about BH that you said, well, wow. hmm, who'd have thunk it? Um, <clears throat> well, I alluded to it. It was that serving as a chaplain. They said to him, well, uh, Lieutenant Roberts, you're 60 and we can cut you some flight. No, I will do anything the boys do. And one of the soldiers said was a hell of a horseman. So he learned something while he was roaming the West with his coffee black. Um, that, was, that was amazing to me. Another thing that was amazing to me was his absolute tenacity. He, he, he just, and it cost him, it cost him family time, but he worked hard at the things he worked on. And, and he was what we would call today a lifelong learner. I mean, he had no real formal education. The education at the University of Deseret was not bad <laughs> for 1890, 18, eight, uh, 70s and 80s, but it certainly was not the school it is today. But, um, but he read widely and he'd start quoting and he read Shakespeare and all kinds of things. And, I, you know, was he the only person in Utah that read Shakespeare? No, I'm sure he wasn't. But when you consider where he came from, that was pretty amazing to me. He said one time about the Tovies. He said, the old lady taught me how to read. It wasn't a very good deal. And I slept most of the time under the bar, you know, on the table in the bar. But the old lady, I'll give her this, she taught me to read and it's, it's opened the whole world to me. So that was sort of interesting. Um, as I said, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with him. And I didn't talk about this here, but one of the things that disappoints me the most was his attitude on race. And um, he, his views really were part of what led the church to the priesthood denial, which took place as a policy in 1912. And one of the missions he was sent on was, was to go to the South and convince the South of three things. We're not practicing polygamy. That was the worst thing for Mormon missionaries in the South. They're stealing our wives and girlfriends and going to Utah. A whole colony of women. Went. We're not doing that anymore. Polygamy's over. In fact, we're not gathering the saints anywhere but where they are. We're not bringing them to Utah. There are a huge number of Southern Mormon converts who settled over in the San Luis Valley in Colorado, still there today. Um, and the third thing is, why don't you tell these folks our views on race are just about like theirs? And so he talks about miscegenation. He talks about you know, if you advocate that, uh, the church would you'd face discipline. Uh, it's a tenet of our faith. It's a commandment of God. The church policy is a little different. Um, but I think you would find we're pretty much on the same page with y'all. And the New Orleans, a New Orleans newspaper, Times Democrat, I think, said, you know what? We don't need the misguided followers of old Joe Smith to tell us about miscegenation. We understand all that. But the fact of the matter is between miscegenation on the one hand and polygamy on the other, there's not much of a gap. And we can see right through what you're doing. Again, like with suffrage, it was not his finest moment. 
So there were things about him. Um, one last thing, when he was mission president, the missionaries loved him. They loved him. They, they did. He, he had a they had a group of missionaries that had and spouses that had served between 1922 and 1927 that went on for 50 years, meeting once a year and stuff. They really, they really um, loved him, and he could be a tough taskmaster. He said, um, you know, you send all these missionaries out, they know on the first darn thing about Mormonism. I'm going to change that. And he had mission schools and bring them in and teach them doctrine. And his wife, Margaret, was a doctor and she'd teach him hygiene and, and all kinds of things. He was a very advanced thinker in that way. But he also liked to have a good time. And at one point, one of the missionaries records, we went to a Yankees game. Saw, saw Ty Cobb. The Yankees played the Tigers. Saw Babe Ruth hit a home run. Okay, all right, that's impressive. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Please. You made a big point of uh, contrasting Robert's account of his marriage versus all the other information. Right. So do you conclude he was simply disingenuous or lying, or what do you conclude? You know, uh, I'm willing to, to, to kind of let him, uh, to not say he was lying. I, I'll say he was being disingenuous. Just as he was when he said he didn't practice polygamy, even though he'd just taken his second wife. And he never deviated from it. Never, never. It was always 10 years before. Now, when you look at the census, you could say, well, no, wait a minute, 10 years, uh, 1900 census, 1999, 98, 97, 96, 95, 94, 95, 94, 95, 94 95, 91. Maybe it was 91. Maybe it meant 10 years. 90 to 100 is 10 years. I don't know. I, I don't know why he would, I know why he said what he said at the Smith hearings, but why he would continue, and, I mean, document a lot of stuff in his life, but that's one thing he never documented. So I don't know, as I say, tell me the real story. And everybody, all historians have a, um, a bias, and, and that may show mine to, to not believe him. Um, but with that letter from the, from the church, history library that says, nope, it happened sometime between 1892 and 1894. And he probably said it was D Daniel H. Wells because he was a guy that was dead by then and we couldn't f ask him. That's a pretty compelling evidence. To me, that's the most compelling. Mike Quinn's source is not there. Uh, I expect Charles Moyston Owen, he was busy rounding up all the polygamists. Of course, he thought it was post-manifest marriage. Uh, Margaret was clearly, um, by the time he married Margaret, who is, um, gosh, several years older than BH, um, she was an accomplished um, doctor, um, thinker, and his stand on suffrage must have got her in hot water because she was friends with a lot of those women suffragists, and, and Mormon women suffragists. Um, but he was, she was kind of the, the woman he thought a man of his stature should be married to. And he, he um, at the Smoot hearings, they say, well, when did you tell your wives? Oh, I didn't tell them for a couple of years. How come? Well, I didn't want to embarrass them. Well, okay. He continues to have children with them, however, over that period from 1890 to the last, actually, the last child's born in 1902 and the last, it's, it's two sets of twins. And in that last set of twins in 1902, one of them, um, of course, Richard, no, anyway, one of those twins is the longest living of his children. He dies in 1982. Richard Roberts, his father, Harold, died two years before. So, and I, I think he loved Louisa. There's a touching uh, letter in his, uh, an account in his diary where he says, here I am, I'm 25 years old. I'm the world's biggest failure. I couldn't be a farmer. I couldn't teach. Uh, I married this, this woman who was way above my station. And it's the smartest thing I ever did. Why she puts up with a guy like me. You know, I'm just a total miserable failure. And I said, kid, you're 25 years old. You got 50 years, you're gonna be all over the world. You know, it's, it just breaks your heart. So he loved the women. On the other hand, um, when, uh, when Louisa died, Roberts was back in New York and said, 
hold on to the funeral. I'm on my way. Well, the Wise's family said, yeah, get here if you do, or get here if you don't. And they went ahead and held the funeral. On the way back, he stopped in Chicago and took out a wedding license with Margaret. Now, I don't know whether they actually ever got married civilly because the legal wife, Eliza, who was the legal wife, everybody agreed to that, had died. But that left Celia, Richard's grandma, sweet grandma. My God, I can still hear him say in that. And they felt like, uh, to quote Richard's dad, uh, Harold, the old man's turned, us into, turned me into a bastard because he's now gonna marry what, what about my mama and our family? So there was a lot of hard feelings about it. I don't know. You know, I wish I did. I wish I knew, yep, it was this day. Absolutely. And if I'm wrong, second edition, I'll say, well, what was I thinking? <laughs> Please. Sure. Sure. I hope that answered your first one. Most of the figures, when they are disingenuous, yeah. they're doing that. Because it serves some purpose. Yeah. But it doesn't seem in what you presented that there was a purpose for B.H. Roberts to continue to adhere to the 1890s marriage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, um, and he never deviated. He never deviated. We have, um, yeah, we have census records for 1900, 1910. Let's see, 1900, 1910, 1920. And I don't think I ever checked the 1930. But sometimes he's listed as as married to Louisa, and Margaret is the head of the household, but married. Sometimes he's listed as being married to Margaret, and Louisa is listed as being married to the head of the household. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. Um, it, it seems like it's dysfunctional for him to maintain that stand. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like it causes him a lot of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a different posture would have been more advantageous for him. Well, maybe. Now, I don't want to say anything about our late colleague, Richard. But what I learned from Richard is there's a strong streak of, uh, how should we put it, um, um, fierce belief that they're right in that family. <laughs> and they're, by God, they're right. And Richard told me every once in a while, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, I well, probably don't, but so maybe it was that. And he didn't like somebody challenging him. I don't know. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Please. What was his relationship with other general authorities? Because they, they can have pretty strong opinions too. Yeah, it was mixed. Bad and real bad? <laughs> bad and wow. No. Yeah. It, it, you know, uh, they get they did get exasperated with him. They particularly get exasperated with him when when he was drinking, and it was a real problem. And you know, alcoholism is is a real problem. Was then is now. You know, it was. And he was he he could be just mean. He was a mean drunk at times. And um, Jay Golden Kimball, who loved him as a brother. He comes in the office one day and said, I've had it with him. He's full of alcohol. He's talking like a madman. I don't have it. When he died, J. Reuben Kimball, I've lost the best friend I ever had. I learned more from him. I can't believe he's gone. Um, there's a story, it's not a true story, but it's a good story. <laughs> the story is that Jay Golden, y'all know who Jay Golden Kimball was? The sweetest man. OK, well, the story goes that after Roberts's funeral in 1933, they took him to that little cemetery in Centerville, way up on the hill. A lot less of Centerville then than there is now. And according to the story, uh, J. Rudin Kimball got there and he looked out over the land and he looked over the cemetery and said, this is a hell of a place to bury one of the Lord's anointed. The problem with that was Heber J. Grant announces, uh, Brother Kimball's ill and it won't be at the funeral. So maybe when they're the funeral, he went to the cemetery. I think where it actually happened was when they erected that grave marker because he was there for that. But he said, I didn't have to have, you know, the internet. If I had a question, I said to him, what does this mean? What's this? Tell me about this. And like that. Joseph Fielding Smith, Republican, BH, Democrat, they fought all the time. 
when he was thrown out of the Congress, Joseph F. Smith said, um, it was just rank hypocrisy, just politics. There isn't a man in Congress as honest as B.H. You know? Um, so I don't, there were times, some of them in the quorum of the 70 thought, eh, hey, he's just, he's a hotshot, it's reading Dante, huh? playing chess. Well, the rest of us are out in the stakes and wards fulfilling assignments. Where's, where's Brother Rock? Well, he's running for Congress and he's doing this and doing that. So there was some jealousy. And I think he had some jealousy of some of the intellectuals. That was a powerful period, you know, James E. Talmadge, John A. Witzel, um, others. And it was a pretty heavy duty crew. Uh, and I'm sure there was some professional jealousy. The last thing I'll say about that is Heber J. Grant. And Heber and B.H. got along and then didn't get along and got along and stuff. He came up to Richard's father, Harold, and put his arms around his sh shoulder and said, Harold, what will I do? What will I do without him? It was all forgiven. It was all forgiven. He could be a cantankerous guy. I'll tell you a story. Sterling McMurrin tells this story. McMurrin was old enough that he actually knew him. There was a kind of a, relation, a family relationship, not a close one, but a distant one. But he lived down there in Davis County, and he, he saw B.H. several times. And one time, right before he died, he came to the Adams Ward in Los Angeles. Well, the Adams Ward had a microphone, see, right there. Well, B.H. was doing this and over there, and the bishop came and said, Brother Roberts, could you? And he said, those damn things, we even have one in the tabernacle. I don't need a microphone to be heard. And he said he got so mad that he took his cane and thumped on the podium. And McMurrin said for years after, everybody had to go up and see the mark that the great man had made. <laughs> he also said he hit the... He had one time he hit the lectern so hard, his false teeth flew out. <laughs> he grabbed him and in one movement, put him back in his seat. Good story, kind of like that one of Jake Old. Cal Rampton told me it happened in Battlefield. Okay, I don't know whether it happened anywhere, but good story. Other questions or comments? Well, you've been most attentive. Uh, I know there's some refreshments back there. My friend Brian Buchanan back there would be happy to sell you my book or his book or anything. If you're interested, I'm sure. Uh, I, if you have questions and want to talk with me privately, if you don't mind, I'll put on my uh, Frito Bandito mask and, and we can chat. But I do appreciate you being here. I hope that uh, you find that I did an okay. I hope. Here's the other thing, Sarah. If I ever meet BH in the, in the world beyond, I think I'm going to say, to, did I do okay by you? Did I edit those diaries reasonably well? You may agree or disagree with the biography, but did I do okay by you? And if he says, not bad, take that as a compliment. <laughs> Thanks again. Appreciate it. Very much. Yeah, Let's do it. I'm up. Now you got to help me find my glasses. Where they are. <laughs> there they are. You found them? Yeah. Let me just leave this back. Yeah, you're fine. Hey, Melissa. Good. Good. Good.